two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the curriculum committee for Thursday, January 20th, 2022. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely. Subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's curriculum committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through a Microsoft Teams live event. Live event. Links can be found on the BCPS website and on board docs. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board member, members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as re when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, could you please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. And Mr. Thomas? Yes. Would you also please call and note the names of all staff members participating in the meeting? Dr. McComas? Present. Dr. Holmes? Present. Dr. Emmeldorf? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Parandosi? Present. And could you also determine if there are other members participating on the call that you have not named? I have Ms. Nelson? Present. Ms. Stansbury? Present. Dr. Woolridge? Present. And Mr. Billingsley? I don't think he showed up yet. I think that's um, it. Super tier two, Ms. Cox. Okay, the committee chair will facilitate discussion by calling off the names of committee members to speak in turn. The committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair and then saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions. Um, staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak then saying their name. Um, if there are no further questions, I will turn it over to Dr. McComas to go ahead and get us started. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you and um, welcome committee members to today's um, session. Our fir all, first, let me just say all of our um, items today are uh, materials for instruction and to support uh, their instructional programs um, and they are items for approval. So. Um, our first item today will be um, a presentation by Dr. Elmendorf and his team on blended um, and online student courses. And at this point, I'll hand it over to Dr. Elmendorf, Ms. Schubert, and Ms. Um, Nelson. Actually, I think Ms. Schubert. I think Ms. Nelson's under the weather today. So. Right. Thank you, Dr. McComas and uh, Ms. Cox. I don't know if you, you caught that earlier, but Ms. Schubert is here as well when we do attendance. So um, we are really excited to talk to you about this today. Um, Ms. Schubert and I will be presenting. Ms. Nelson is here because this is tremendously important to her and she was planning on presenting until this morning, but like Dr. McComas said, she is under the weather. So um, we thank her for being here and we hope that she feels better soon. All right, next slide, please. In our teaching and learning framework, BCPS holds the core belief that instruction must be accessible for all students. Accessible instruction promotes equity for students and their learning irrespective of student backgrounds and abilities and disrupts disproportionate outcomes. Ms. Schubert is going to share some specific information related to our self-paced blended learning options. Next slide, please. So good afternoon, everyone. I am excited to share with you information about our um, blended and fully online courses that are utilized in Baltimore County Public Schools. So we believe that students often need options in order to meet with success. Our self-paced blended learning courses utilize digital content that is taught through several programs, including our school programs for the acceleration and recovery of credits, otherwise known as SPARC, 
Um, and that program happens in all of our high schools after school, on weekends, and even in some of our BCBS schools during the day. Another program is the Extended Day Learning Program, or the EDLP, which occurs in the evenings and on Saturday mornings, and the Extended Year Program, or EYLP, and e-learning. These programs allow BCBS high school students to recover credits or earn original credits, supporting students towards high school graduation. In all of our self-paced blended learning programs, students work through digital content with the assistance and support of BCBS certified teachers. Educational Opportunity partners with academic offices and Ms. Shea's team to ensure curricular alignment and to ensure that our blended learning courses match both the content and the rigor of our traditional face-to-face -face courses. The self-paced nature of these courses honors the learning that students bring to the table. So we love that although a student might have failed a course previously, we can't work on the assumption that a student has learned or mastered none of that content. So our self-paced blended learning courses allow students to, and I like to use the analogy of driving, hit the gas in areas where they may already have mastery, and then they can hit the brakes in the areas where they're having greater difficulty. That's where our amazing BCBS self-paced blended learning teachers step in and lean in on the process to guide, remediate, and enrich our students through these courses. On average, a self-paced blended learning course takes students about 180 hours to complete. Another course option that we'd like to share with you today is the Maryland Virtual Learning Opportunities, or MVLO, fully online courses, which are available to BCBS high school students. The MVLO digital subscription content and providers are reviewed and approved by MSDE and then in turn reviewed and approved by BCPS and again we partner with Ms. Shea's team in academics. These are fully online courses provided by a vendor with the vendor providing a teacher. While this option is accessed by fewer BCPS students, it is another option for students who may have a scheduling conflict or who attend a BCBS school that may or may not offer a specific course. Finally, digital content has been made available to K-12 BCBS students the last few th summers through our summer learning hike. This occurred in summer of 2020 and summer of 2021. The summer learning hike, an optional summer learning opportunity, offered students access to personalized digitalized instruction in English language arts and mathematics. The personalized instruction identifies and address, addresses learning gaps that typically occur in the summer. Sometimes you'll hear us refer to the summer slide and works with students to ensure they're ready for grade level instruction in the upcoming year. The purpose of the summer learning hike has been to offer students the opportunity to review reading and math content from the current school year. Similar content is also being used this school year to allow students to review content during extended day and extended week re-engagement sessions. The re-engagement program in each BCBS school may choose to use digital content to provide students with access to grade level materials, tasks and assignments coupled with appropriate scaffolds that make work accessible. Next slide, please. So we wanted to share with you the summer learning hike um, that I just shared some information about. And again, that began in summer of 2020 um, and was available again in summer of uh, 2021. Next slide, please. Board members, are there any questions? Sorry, this is, I think this is the wrong iteration of the PowerPoint. Yeah, I did have some data slides. It was, it was right up until then, somehow. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Corns, can I? Would it work if I sent you this one, or if I could share it? I. Yeah. Do you want to share it, Doug? And sure. Then I'll take over after. Yeah, Gypsy is um, managing the slides today. As um, Jim actually says, I'm unable to present. I don't think I have permission yeah. to do so. You have to go down at the bottom. If you go bottom of the screen, you'll see that. Presentation. I, I, right. I don't think I, I don't think I have permission to present. I think it's the. Because it did the same thing to me, but then I hit the bottom and Jim said hit the bottom and then you should be able to. Hit the bottom where it says present like that little uh, icon to present at the bottom of the PowerPoint. Down at the lower right. 
Okay. Um, Dr. Elmendorf, do you want to send it to me and I can try to present for you? Oh, uh, I think you, I got have it. It. you got it. There yep. we go. Okay, <laughs> thank you everyone for your graciousness while we work through yeah. the technical. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. OK, so I talked a little bit about our blended and fully online courses. Each school year through our blended learning courses, thousands of BCBS students enroll in our SPARC, our EYLP, our EDLP, and or our e-learning program to recover credits and or earn original credits. Blended courses are aligned with the BCBS curriculum standards, as I shared. Students must demonstrate 80% mastery of course content before moving on in the course. So if you think about the traditional structure of a course, there is the entire course, there are units, and then there are lessons, and we require 80% of all of the assessments built in throughout. Students take the BCPS final exams or the vendor final exam as determined by content offices, and final exams are calculated into student final course grades as directed by the grading and reporting manual. As with any program, evaluating impact is critical. The data we will share and discuss in the next few slides are also data points included each year in the Educational Opportunities Office Performance Planner OPP. OPP metrics are reviewed throughout each school year by the director, me, our executive director, Dr. Elmendorf, and Superintendent Williams Cabinet. Let's begin looking at our self-paced funded learning student enrollment and credits earned over the last few school years. Since school year 1819, over 7,000 student users, and remember some of these students do take more than one of our courses, have participated in self-paced blended learning courses, and nearly 5,000 credits have been earned through the programs. Next slide, please. So I talked a little bit about our Maryland Learning Virtual Opportunity or MVLO courses. Um, it is a, um, an option that's used a little bit less than our fully um, self-paced blended courses, but we do have students who um, absolutely use our MVLO courses. It's a viable pathway to course completion for students. MVLO courses allow BCBS students to take a fully online course for original credit through an MSDE approved vendor. And as I mentioned, this vendor is providing the actual uh, teacher in the course. Um, our team works with schools to assign what we have termed a BCBS coach. So that's a BCBS uh, teacher in the building who provides students with that face-to-face -face assistance in the building. So that could be tutoring, it could be proctoring with exams, it could be reviewing some goal setting and staying on pace for course completion. Uh, while enrollment numbers are low, as you can see, this option still presents another pathway to high school graduation and course access. There is no charge for these courses and BCBS pays um, the full price for these courses for any student participating. Next slide, please. So then finally, we're most proud to share the impact that these blended and online courses have um, on our students as illustrated by enrollment and credit attainment. Our team is also excited to share that the impact that these courses and programs have on our overall graduation rate in Baltimore County Public Schools. As you can see, educational options with access to the resources shared and described with you today have had a significant impact on the overall BCPS graduation rate for the last few years. For the last three years, nearly one in every five graduates participated in one or more of our self-paced blended learning courses MVL or MVLO courses as a part of their high school academic journey. We're proud to be a part of a student's journey towards graduation and even more proud to provide options to credit recovery and credit attainment. Next slide, please. So all of the teachers who are working with students in this course are, are really where the magic happens and probably um, what are the most critical pieces to our students meeting with success. All teachers who work in self-paced blended learning programs are provided with access to professional development surrounding the four self-paced blended learning implementation standards that you see on this slide. Professional learning is provided throughout the year 
and always prior to our summer program known as the extended year learning program. We differentiate our um, professional development for teachers based on where they are in this journey. If they're a novice teacher, we, we start with the basics all the way up to our advanced users who have been teaching in this model for quite a few years. Additionally, school-based um, just-in-time professional development is offered by staff in our office throughout the school year. Um, we go into schools, we visit schools, we complete fidelity checks in schools, we meet with teachers, we meet with students, um, and sometimes that PD is a shoulder-to-shoulder -to, -shoulder to show a teacher um, how to do something, how to provide support, or maybe a model for goal setting, and sometimes it's a much more formal professional development that either teachers request or a principal requests. At the February 8th Board of Education meeting, contract ASI 811-21, blended and online student courses will be presented. The funding of this $2.9 million five-year contract supports the program shared with you today and ultimately supports our Baltimore County Public School students in their pathway to high school graduation. So at this point, are there any questions about our blended and online courses? Ms. Pasteur? Thank you. Um, these are some really helpful programs. Thank you for this presentation. Um, how has the pandemic impacted uh, these programs? Evening school, um, um, homeschooling, and some of the other ones, especially when we take a look at our staffing shortages. Um, and can you include in your answer, please, how you use retirees or consultants for any of these programs, if you do. Thank you. Sure, so um, all of our programs have run um, straight through the pandemic as soon as we returned to schools in April of 2020. I think I have my dates correct. Um, our extended day learning program resumed, e-learning resumed, our SPARK programs that are school-based resumed. Um, they uh, functioned in a virtual format for the remainder of school year 2020 and through um, last school year. This school year, those programs um, are meeting face-to-face. -face. So remember, um, SPARK programs are in our schools, so our school buildings um, are open every day. Um, right now, as you're aware, our after-school and extracurricular activities have been virtual for the last few weeks, shifting back next week to face-to-face. -to -face. So um, really, Ms. Pestor, to your question, um, we've adapted quite well to that virtual format. Um, I will say both in our SPARK programs, our EDLP programs, and even our EYLP um, programs in the summer, we have amazing dedicated teachers um, working who are committed to our At Promise students. Um, we have not had staffing shortages um, after school work in our EDLP and then in the summer. Obviously, teachers are paid for that additional time, and we have been very fortunate because we know that's not always the case, um, that we still have teachers who are looking to do that work. Our teachers who do work, you asked specifically about consultants and retired teachers, our teachers who do work in all of the programs, whether it's an after school spark program at a school, or extended day learning program or extended year learning program are currently uh, full-time Baltimore County teachers. So these teachers are doing um, their work during the day and then they do um, the other options. Uh, where, and I, I let me use some of the e-learning where some of the teachers in the schools were actually identified in the school by the administration uh, to do that because there were a number of students, enough students to be able to do that and other ancillary things. So I would imagine now though that they would have to be doing more classroom work as well, considering our staffing um, numbers in many of the schools. So again, you're saying that everything is flowing pretty much as it had been. How do with the number of emails that I'm sure we all see in terms of people who are dissatisfied with one thing or another, how do we, when we refer them uh, to your office or um, to some other office, how do they know what the other options are and 
how they might access them. I hope that question makes sense, but we get a lot of email from folks who are dissatisfied with one thing or, or another. How do they know that about all of these other things, which under even the best of circumstances might be better for their children than what they're going through now? That's a great question, Ms. Pasteur. I, I think um, what most people are emailing you and, and I about is um, a desire to be in the virtual learning program. And then when they hear that that enrollment has since passed, they're interested in perhaps some other opportunities. Most of what we presented today requires some type of in-person interaction with the exception of the MVLO um, that was discussed. And there are only 19 courses that are offered through MVLO, so it's in their advanced courses, so that's somewhat limited. I can tell you that some of the students in our virtual learning program are using some of those MVLO courses, MVLO courses in some um, cases, but as you can see, the enrollment in MVLO is pretty low. Um, so when someone calls me and says, I, I want my child to be virtual, there are uh, several options. One is if there is a really significant medical need um, that really is new and warrants uh, the virtual learning program, we will run that through health services to see if that's the most appropriate um, placement. And then, of course, we have our home and hospital um, program, which is for students who demonstrate some type of medical um, or social emotional need of theirs that's documented that they could go through home and hospital. Um, and then, of course, we do have e-learning, um, which is currently um, pretty well, much at capacity, but we have uh, students who are um, assigned to e-learning as well in some cases. Thank you. The other thing I will add is our partnership with our school counselors is critical. Um, so we work with school counselors every year, both our department chairs and brand new school counselors um, to help them understand all the options that are available to students, um, both for credit recovery and credit acceleration. So they can then have that conversation with families and students um, in terms of the different options. Mr. And Thomas, that, oh, I'm good. sorry, Ms. Pasteur. I just want to say thank you. Um, that's good, and I'm glad you put in the piece about the counselors, because sometimes we, I, I'll say, check with your school first or your counselor, and they'll skip that. They want to either come to, to the board members or go to an <laughs> office, and the counselors do have this information. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Mack. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, so. My first question is about the e-learning program. So I remember in middle school, a friend of mine transitioned to go to the e-learning program instead of being in the school building. But now that we have the virtual learning program, what's really the difference between the e-learning and virtual learning program? Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Schubert. You're, you're super familiar with both, so go ahead, Ms. Schubert. Thank you. So e-learning has existed actually for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. um, and e-learning um, at the core of e-learning, um, it, it is a virtual learning program, middle school and high school. So VLP also has an elementary component. Um, and e-learning is really accessed by students um, in three different ways. E-learning um, can be accessed by some of our home and hospital students. When, so when a student um, needs home and hospital services at the middle school or high school level, e-learning is an option. And sometimes that works for our home and hospital students. Um, e-learning is also a placement option for students who are alternatively placed through our student conduct hearing officers based on um, a need and placement uh, based on behavior. Um, and e-learning is a placement option there. And then finally, and probably where the majority of our students um, come from, Mr. Thomas, are what we call voluntary co-enrollment. So mm -hmm. it's a student who's attending, and it sounds like this is what you're familiar with, attending um, one of our brick and mortar schools, but for some reason needs to access e-learning. And that could be for a variety of reasons. Um, it could be a scheduling conflict. It could be that their school doesn't offer a course that e-learning offers. Um, it could be that um, the student is experiencing um, a, some kind of issue that precludes them um, from attending school. Um, and so we have rolling enrollment in e-learning, right? So a student um, could enroll tomorrow if um, if our courses aren't full. I will tell you this year, e-learning is quite popular and many of our courses are full. But typically we have this rolling enrollment process, right? So we're following 
like your courses um, at Eastern Tech, we follow the same scope and sequence of what's happening in the end of January in any of our schools is, is pretty much on pace what's happening at e-learning. So students kind of come and go with this fluid enrollment, whereas virtual learning um, students, it will, we were looking for a one year commitment. Um, students spent the entire year in that virtual learning program. Um, E-learning also currently does not um, have a pathway to high school graduation, so we don't, and as a high school student, I know you're very familiar, we don't have all of those um, uh, graduation requirement courses, so a student couldn't start as a freshman and then spend four years at E-learning and graduate. Okay, so if you're in E-learning, you have to at some point transition back to your high school? At this point, yes, it's not a full comprehensive high school. Yeah, okay. keep in mind the uh, inception and origin of e-learning has never been for it to be a full-time, mm -hmm. like permanent placement, right? It's okay. designed for a very specific temporary period of time. If you're there um, designated through the superintendent's hearing office, it's dur for that duration. You know, if you're a student who's volunteered voluntarily taking courses, the course you would stay for the duration of the course that you're either getting caught up on or maybe you're trying to accelerate on. Um, but it was never designed to be a full-time comprehensive replace, a placement, as Ms. Schubert said, where a student would matriculate one grade level to the next one and, and be able to accomplish a diploma uh, in that fashion. Okay, but then in the virtual learning program, seniors that are in VLP right now are getting their diploma and they are continuing Okay. You um, can really think of the virtual learning program as being three separate schools almost, except that they're online. They 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 okay. um, operate that way, even though they're called programs. Okay, thank you. That that clears up a lot of the confusion that I had with with that. Um, and my other question is for the Maryland virtual learning opportunities. Um, I was last year looking into participating in this, or two years ago, I wanted to continue taking another AP course, but it wasn't offered at my school. Um, and so my question is, can one of the courses that you take in the MBLO, can that satisfy a graduation requirement that you have in your school, you would have to take in high school? Yes, that's a great question. And yes, it can. Um, and that's part of um, the work that we do. So um, Maryland State Department of Education releases their approved courses with their approved vendors. Our next step is to look at those courses, and that's where we partner with academics and Ms. Shea's team um, and um, get approval from BCPS. Um, and then once an MVLO course is approved, um, students earning that credit, um, it is a BCPS credit, so it counts towards high school graduation. That's a great okay. question. And could a student hypothetically, I know most high schools offer eight classes in a school day, could they take seven classes and then take this at one of the programs, one of the MVLO courses as an eighth class? Or is it just you take eight and these are additional courses you can also take? It happens both ways. So we have students who will take their eight classes and then actually through MVLO or any of the programs I shared, we have students who are um, taking additional courses, maybe for credit acceleration or credit recovery. Um, and then sometimes we have students who use some of the courses we discussed today to comprise the eight credits or eight courses they're taking within a year. That's another awesome. great question. <laughs> and which schools are predominantly like these students coming from? Because I know, at Eastern Tech, I have a friend in one of these programs right now because they want to take more AP courses than are offered. But I mean, are students coming from schools that maybe don't offer AP courses taking advantage of the AP courses in the program? Or is it more for those students that are already high achieving and they're taking more AP courses to the course load? Are you asking specifically with the MVLO program? Yes. Yeah. Um, it varies. I mean, I, sh I shared the data. Our enrollment is fairly low each school yeah. year. It varies year to year. Um, I mean, I can get back to the board members with specific schools for MVLO enrollment if that's something we're looking for. Yeah, I, just for some context, that, that would be great if you could. Mm -hmm. um, and how? what are some of the, are there any strategies to try to increase enrollment in the MVLO programs? I know that in conversation with Dr. McComas, you know, we talked about, you know, wanting to explore programs that students can take outside of their traditional hours. I mean, so I'm just wondering, you know, it, it decreased, I'm assuming, uh, one of the confounding variables for that was the pandemic um, when it went from 37 to 19. Um, but, you know, what are the plans to try to get the increased enrollment there? So I think going back to Ms. Pastor's uh, question, again, partnering with um, school counselors, because that's really where that conversation would begin with the student. I'm looking to date this course. I have a, a scheduling conflict or this course isn't offered. Um, 
the other piece we work with, to be quite frank, with these um, Maryland virtual learning opportunity courses is to then work with school counselors to understand when that course would be a fit and when that course might not be a fit. Um, they are fully online courses, which um, is very different than what happens with our self-paced courses where you have a teacher side by side with you. Um, fully online courses, you know, some of those courses and it varies by vendor. Um, you might have a weekly check-in with your online teacher. It might be less frequent than that. And for some of our high school learners, that model works. For some of our learners, that model does not work. So we continue to work with counselors to help everyone understand all of the options that are available, but also to understand which option might be a good fit for um, certain uh, learning styles with their students. Thank you. And I have one final question. I know I'm taking a while on this, Max, sorry. Um, I was wondering, there's a, have there has been a reduction in the courses that are offered? I know, um, Dr. Elmendorf, you mentioned that there are currently, I believe, 19 courses, but I'm looking at the list right now, and what I wanted to take Latin three and what it used to be on this list, but it's not on there anymore. So why are some of the courses, I guess, going down um, with that are offered in MVLO? So as I shared each year, we run that list, the state approved okay. list past academics mm -hmm. um, in terms of offering. I will tell you, um, Ms. Hernandez and I engage in lots of conversations around that world language. World language, as I understand it, and certainly was not my core competency as a learner uh, many years ago in school, is a tough, um, world language courses are tough in an online format, um, but we will continue to have those conversations with academics about courses offered. Okay. Thank you so much. Mr. Offerman. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to clarify what I, I believe I heard and we and we saw it in a in a uh, in a, uh, a bar graph that uh, one in five graduates is meeting their graduation requirements uh, based on based on one of these programs or am I or, or am I uh, or am I uh, or am I not right about that? You heard correctly, Mr. Offerman. So we looked at our um, self-paced blended learning programs, EYLP, EDLP, Spark, MVLO and e-learning and in school year 1819, uh, just over 19% of our um, graduates participated in one of those programs somewhere in their high school journey. It might have been multiple times. In school year 1920, tw over 21% of graduates. And in school year 2021, over 17% of graduates. So on average, we're looking at about one in five graduates participated in one of these programs in that journey to high school graduation. Thank you. Of course. Anything else, Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Causey. Good afternoon and thank you for this presentation. Um, I was curious if there is a table that is already developed that ha lists the courses available in each of the options. That's certainly something that the team can work on gathering for you. They do vary program to program, but that's information we certainly can get. OK, that would be helpful. Um, so that information that is not available on the website for students or parents to access. Um, information on course offerings is available under each of the options. So what um, the extended day program offers or e-learning and the envelope MBLO courses, but we can put it together in one table for board members. OK, thank you. And then is um, there a has there been a calculation or is it provided by vendors for the cost per student? per course in these different options? Um, it varies vendor to vendor. Um, there are multiple vendors who are used across all of these programs, so I can speak <laughs> in averages. Um, so for our Maryland Virtual Learning Opportunity courses, those courses run an average of um, about $800 a course per student. Um, and, you know, of course, vendor to vendor, that's going to fluctuate in, in both directions. Um, and then in terms of our self-paced blended learning courses, we work with several vendors there as well. We don't pay by course, Ms. Causey. We actually um, pay per seat. Um, and because of our usage, um, and we, we shared the, the data across EYLP and EDLP, we um, actually have a contract that allows um, access to unlimited seats because of, of the number that we use. And I, I can certainly 
work on an actual number. I don't have uh, because we don't price it that way. I don't have a number available at the moment. OK, thank you. Um, yes, a calculation would be helpful. And can you unpack per seat? What does that mean? Sure. So um, with a lot of um, digital content, sometimes you um, are charged per course, right? So um, if Mr. Thomas was taking an Algebra 1 course, and sorry, I always use this as my student example, and a World History course, we would pay um, for two courses in that example. Um, with our vendors, um, some of our vendors we use less of, we pay per course, but the vendor that we use predominantly, um, we have seats available to every student um, because that pricing structure was actually more cost effective. Okay, thank you for that. And then with the different op um, options, what is the grading um, scale that is used? Currently, our high schools use, uh, some use zero to 100 and some use 50 to 100. Uh, and the board was supposed to receive that in the list um, at some point. Um, but in order to get to that 80% achievement, um, I'm curious what the grading scales are. So in our self-paced blended learning courses, we use a grading scale of zero to 100. Uh, mastery is set at 80%. So if the student works through a lesson and takes the quiz associated with that lesson and doesn't meet with mastery at 80%, a student has an opportunity to go back and rework through the content. Um, however, after two attempts of not meeting with success, that's when our amazing teachers are critical, right? So at that point, a student has not met with success twice, and that's where remediation, intervention, differentiation needs to occur. Um, but it is a zero to 100 scale for our grading and our self-paced blended learning programs. Okay, thank you. And has there been an evaluation as to the effectiveness in terms of the student achievement, um, which types of learning uh, work better or just in terms of what is the overall achievement and success of our students in these programs? So there has not been a formal um, evaluation per se. Um, the measures we use um, in our office progress plan, as I shared, we do look at um, course enrollment um, and we look at uh, credit attainment as well as impact on graduation rate. In the interest of um, thank time, you very much. thank you, Ms. Causey. I have a few questions. Um, Maryland has a requirement if a student uh, to graduate that was previously met by bridge plans. Do any of these programs replace bridge plans? They don't replace the bridge plan. Um, these are for actual um, credits for a, a course requirement. I can tell you sometimes students are working on the credit and the bridge plan at, this, at concurrently um, and the programs support that work, have supported that work in the past. OK, thank you. And then as far as the Maryland um, virtual learning opportunity, I think you said this. I just wanted to be clear. If we had no students who signed up, would we still owe the vendor money or is it by use? MVLO is by use, ma'am. OK, and then what is included in this contract? Is it salaries, technologies, CNI resources, uh, overtime? Sure, the contract is for access to the digital content in the programs that we discussed today. So it is digital content. Yeah. And in the programs that have teachers that the vendor provides, it pays those teachers? So the cost, uh, the salary for teachers working above and beyond the school day is covered through operating funds. BCPS operating funds? Correct. For and BCPS teachers that are working with the programs, right. but the teachers but that I are provided by the vendors is included. programs provided teachers. So the MVLO, when we um, uh, purchase a course for a student, they provide the teacher. All of the other programs, we are using BCPS teachers. And do we have access to either grants or ESSER funds to um, pay those teachers who are willing to work past their eight classes or whatever it is, or we are we going to fund them totally out of this contract? So the teacher, BCBS teachers who are supporting our students I'm, aren't funded out of the contract. That's operating, operating budget. Operating, right? Thank you. And it could be, I'm sure. OK, thank you. Um, do I have a motion to approve this contract? So move, Thomas. Second. Any, is there a second? So I can have Ms. Cox, can you do a roll call vote, please? 
Yes. Ms. Um, Matt, Matt? I had a question about the contract itself. Um, go ahead, Ms. Causey. I'm trying to get back to it. I, I don't see it on board docs. Right. Let me clarify, Ms. Causey, since this is not contracts committee, this is not the building and contracts committee, as you know, since you were chair of that. This is the curriculum committee and, and the distinction really here, what we're seeking approval here today is not the business terms of the contract, but rather the instructional approval. Are, are These are materials that meet an instructional need. Um, and do we approve continuing to use these materials to support the instructional program? Um, the kind of the nuts and bolts of the business contract of the of these resources is what you see in the contract exhibits. And so those exhibits are not included as part of the curriculum uh, presentation because it's our purpose here is the instructional purpose, um, not the actual business contract side of that. So I, I hope I helped uh, describe how these two committees work in concert um, and, and at the same time make sure that we don't um, like I can't do the business of the contracts committee here. If that makes so sense. I under, thank you for that. Um, yes, I know I'm in the curriculum committee um, I, <clears throat> and I do appreciate the distinction, but it has been brought up that um, it is important for uh, the curriculum committee to understand the costs associated. We have a limited budget and many, many needs. Um, also, I don't see a list of what the resources are. There's the graphic under educational options on the slide, but I don't see the uh, actual list of resources. So I'm, I'm not understanding what the vote in is actually approving. Or Ms. Causey, okay. oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead Dr. McClemmons. No, no, go ahead, Ms. Mack. Ms. Causey, um, I can follow up with you after the meeting. I, I understand that it might be critical, but in the interest of time, um, we have had, I know you haven't been on this committee, but we have had this conversation. I have raised this issue numerous times, and perhaps we need to tighten that up a little bit so that board members do have information, um, even at a per pupil cost, which is what I think we were getting in the past, and then it kind of stopped. So um, I will work with Dr. McComas to um, get that back in place. Um, but we are not we are not provided in our current model with the specifics of the contract. Well, buildings and contracts does not even receive the details of the contract. They receive a spending authority, which is usually one or two pages. Right, um, but we'll take that offline because we have four yes. more contracts to go through. OK, but what I'm saying is I don't see those documents in board docs. I don't see any document in board doc that references because we what? do not get the contracts in curriculum committee, but I can work with Dr. McComas to perhaps provide at least minimal information for that on a going forward basis. OK, right. thank you. So could you repeat the motion? Do I have a motion to uh, approve the blended and online student courses? materials or if I need to say blended and online student courses courses and I believe Mr. Thomas um approves yeah he and seconded yeah. by and all Miss Cox can you do a roll call vote please sure Miss Mack yes Mr. Offerman yes Miss Pastor yes Ms. Causey? Abstain. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. OK, the next um, approval item is community schools mobile unit contract, and I'll turn that over to Dr. McComas. Yes, um, thank you. And I'll just share that we'll follow up um, through a weekly update with those things. And Ms. Causey, I'll make sure that we, you know, we provide that list of the courses, which I think is the de some of the detail you're looking for. And um, and the cost, uh, I know it varies by vendor. So we'll see uh, that we can follow that, follow up for you. Um, and so I'd like to introduce Dr. Wisted and Ms. Stansberry. Uh, Ms. Stansberry is our uh, director of Title I, and, and we're bringing forward here um, a new resource to support our community schools um, effort. And so I'll, I'll quickly turn it over to our team so we can um, learn more about the mobile unit. 
Sure, I'll just quickly begin um, reminding people that in October, Ms. Sansbury and I were here um, talking about community schools um, and, and uh, helping the group understand uh, how that section of the blueprint and how it comes in Baltimore County Public Schools. So this um, is, you may recall from the presentation, there was one of the slides where we talked about how um, the funding, you know, we would need support from the board moving forward because fundings, uh, a lot of funding is being provided through the Concentration of Poverty Grant and as a result, resources that schools found um, that they need within their needs assessment may be coming through as approvals in the contracts committee. So here is um, some details about what uh, three of our schools are kind of coming together to spend their funds and Ms. Stansbury is going to explain that to you. Thank you so much. So Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in our next slide, I'll just briefly go through what you should expect to hear from us today, how we're meeting the needs of families in three of our community school communities, what we're doing to gather stakeholder input. We'll also talk about a mock-up design of what the mobile unit could be, um, what the funding source will be, and where, where we are with the next steps. So in the next slide, I just want to kind of Bring back to the forefront our BCPS community school infographic where you can see that the school is the heart of the community, but that services and supports are accessed by families and community members and students all around the school community. And that is exactly what the mobile unit will provide for us. In the next slide, I also want to kind of just remind you of our five commitments as a community school and uh, what our five commitments are for community schools and BCPS and those you see listed here. Everything we talk about related to the mobile unit will address all of five of our Baltimore County community school commitments. So um, you can advance to the next slide for me. The mobile unit really is the brainchild of three of our original state identified community schools. Deep Creek Elementary, Hawthorne, and Sandalwood. And they all um, happen to be in the same area and they all tend to swap students. So when I say swap students, um, Deep Creek has one of the highest mobility rates in the district. And students come to Deep Creek and leave Deep Creek and often find themselves at Sandalwood or Hawthorne. And so the schools felt it would be beneficial if there was a cohesive family student and community support model that was offered to families, students, and the community at all three of these locations. And so basically the unit was something that schools felt, at least three, these three schools felt as though they would like to partner together to build a model that is um, representative of the needs in their community. In our next slide, what you will see is how are we meeting the needs of families using the mobile unit. So the mobile unit will provide an opportunity for families to have ease of access to resources and supports. We are going to provide flexible locations, flexible times. We'll also have resources and information as well as services available for early childhood supports. Our community partners will be available to support families on the mobile unit and off of the mobile unit, as well as providing services to the school community as a collective. So although the three elementary schools mentioned are the ones putting their funding together to provide the mobile unit in the school community, you will find that the benefits will reach outside of just those three elementary schools into middle and high school students who happen to reside in the same families as those of our elementary students, school students for those communities. In the next slide, this is an example of how we've collected stakeholder input on what exactly do we need in this mobile unit. So in all three schools, they have met with their, or are continuing to meet with their school staff, with their students, families, community partners, 
local businesses to all have a voice in what exactly are the needs in the community that should be represented in the mobile unit itself. On the next slide, Gypsy, if you could advance for me, you'll see a sample of this unit. So I'm not sure how clearly you can see the information on here, so I'll kind of walk through this with you. At the very back of the unit is a mobile food pantry. This has refrigeration systems, and it also has a um, access point at the back, of, back and the front of the bus to distribute food to families as quickly and easily as possible. In the middle of the unit, you will see a space where student tutoring can take place, where family um, information sessions can occur, resume writing, um, career search, job search, as well as the front of the unit has an opportunity for families to come and receive medical services, vision, dental, as well as um, vaccination services. There is also on the outside of the unit, a place for families to gather together outside of the unit and receive information using an audio visual tool. Um, and that tool has not been solidified in the moment, but that would project outside of the unit, but then be visible for large groups of um, families and community members um, to gather together under like an awning type of, of setup. In the next slide, you'll see the types of services we plan to offer on the mobile unit. So these are some examples of services. Again, we need to really finish collecting input from stakeholders on exactly which services will be offered on the unit itself. So you'll see community rebranding. Um, we hope to be able to work with students in the local high school to build what the wrapping of that unit will look like. The outside wrapping of the unit could potentially be designed by, I believe there's a CTE program at Kenwood that works on visual design that we would be partnering with to build the outside, what the visual outside of the unit will look like. Legal services for families will be accessible on that, could be accessible on the unit as well as career building, tutoring, early childhood programs, dental care, medical exams, vision services, social services report, supports, health services, and of course the food pantry, which seems to be um, a reoccurring theme in what we've collected from stakeholders thus far. In the next slide, the funding source. So as you heard from Melissa, um, Dr. Wistit just a, a moment ago, there is an exceptional amount of funding coming into community schools through the Concentration of Poverty Grant. The Concentration of Poverty Grant is divided into two grant allocations to schools individually. One is a personnel grant that is to fund the community school facilitator position as well as a healthcare practitioner at every community school that is identified by the state of Maryland. Then there is a per pupil grant. Now the per pupil grant um, actually is allocated in year three of identification by the state and the per pupil grant funding should be used to implement the school's community school multi-year plan. Hawthorne, Deep Creek and Sandalwood are all in year three of being a community school and are building their community school multi-year plan and finalizing their needs assessment as we speak. The, so, the cost associated with the unit would be building a custom unit from the ground up that takes about 365 days, as well as annual maintenance and operating costs and unit management. We plan to work with, <coughs> excuse me, community partners to develop a unit management um, system in which there will be someone on the unit to bring the unit into the community in the evenings, during the school day, on the weekends, and at times that the community seems to believe that it is most accessible for them. In the next slide, 
I like to just wrap up and just kind of reiterate the fact that the community school initiative goes beyond the classroom and the school building. It is about providing the supports that are necessary for the community at a location and during a time when the community can access those supports. The mobile unit helps to carry that vision out. And so um, we will hopefully be bringing forward in February a contract to build the very first unit. And I say the very first unit because um, this is an innovative idea that has come out of um, the needs assessment process at all three schools. And what we are noticing is as we begin to talk about the mobile unit with some of our other schools, there is more interest beginning to build. So although what we plan to bring forward is to build one unit for this particular school community, you may find that in the future, we come back and look at the potential of building other units in other communities around the district. And with that being said, I think I am opening the floor up for questions. Board members, any questions? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. That was an excellent uh, presentation. I'm excited and I hope that we'll approve this in contact in February. Uh, the only question I have is you mentioned that this bus was created or not this bus, sorry, the mobile unit uh, was created in consultation with the three schools and many of the communities, but has this been modeled after any other mobile units in other school systems or is there any other like model that this was being used to reference and create this? Yes. So um, I believe we are on the edge of something that could be really amazing and be the first of its kind for community schools. There are tons of mobile units that exist, but they most of the mobile units that we were able to um, visit and, and to find even nationally are focused on one area. So there's a food pantry mobile unit. There is a medical mobile unit, but this mobile unit kind of takes a variety of needs and puts them into one place. Um, Franklin Square Hospital has a medical MedStar mobile unit, and we went to visit that unit and we were able to see all of the possibilities of how you can support families with medical services. However, most of the mobile units that we were able to um, dig deeply into are really Grant, they're supported by grants and they support only a specific population or area. And so while we thought the MedStar medical unit was amazing, um, when we tried to um, have that unit come to our communities in Baltimore County, we found that um, they unfortunately are not able to do so because that was not within the parameters of their grant. And so we did design or began the beginning design of the unit using what occurs at MedStar, but then also looked at some national models and, and found that we could be the first community school mobile unit of its kind. Awesome, thank you so much. Absolutely. Mr. Offerman? Yes, uh, could, uh, could this kind of unit be used for things like uh, registration? To come to, to come to schools because there are certain situations where parents, uh, it's very hard for parents to actually provide their own transportation, and uh, getting to a school in the summer or if you're if you're uh, if you're um, moving into a uh, a new school area, uh, that can uh, that can be very difficult for people with uh, with a uh, very uh, very uh, limited means. Yes, absolutely. So um, the center of the unit is designed for just that. It is a multi-purpose space for um, supporting families or even offering classes and coursework, not really coursework, but family coursework um, for our families to participate in. And so the um, each of the schools felt very strongly that a space for things such as registration on the unit would be helpful particularly when it came to kindergarten. Many of our schools found that um, kindergarten roundup usually takes place. It's like the kindergarten registration system process kicks up in May. But in many of our school, of those three school communities, they have found that a lot of their kindergarten enrollment doesn't occur until almost close to the start of the school year. And so they felt like taking the unit into the community itself 
and having registration in the community versus having the families come into the school building would at least help to start the registration process. There may be a need for some follow up for families, um, but at least we're able to get to those families and begin the registration process, especially for our early learners. Uh, another question is uh, if I can ask is uh, the grant the when, when you say this is this is all coming from grant money are we talking about the actual the actual vehicle or are we talking about the, the the actual operation of the vehicle or I guess I'm concerned or I'm, I, I just like understand better how much uh, how much money uh, BCPS will have to put into this beyond uh, beyond the grant money yes so the entire cost of the unit operating costs construction of the unit itself are all coming from the blueprint concentration of poverty grant. Thank you. Yes. Um, I have a, a question that um, and maybe you said this, but you talked about Hawthorne, Deep Creek and Sandalwood. But I thought that the. And that this unit is for that community. Did, did I hear you say that correctly? Correct, those three communities. So, I mean, I you know I have a, a school in my district that I worry about. Um, so this that school would not have access to these services at all. Is that a true statement? Not at the moment. So the reason why I say that is because right now that school along with the other 17, I'm sorry, the other 18 community schools in BTPS they only have grant funding for personnel staff. They do not have grant funding for the per pupil allocation, which allows to be used for wraparound services. The other 18 schools in our district that are community schools are working on building their needs assessment and providing very immediate um, services. So I'll give you an example. One of our schools, um, they are using the leftover money that has not been used from the personnel grant because staffing costs less than what they expected to build a food pantry at the school itself. Um, another school is using funding for before and after care because that is an immediate need. Um, as schools begin to get the per pupil grant allocation, you will find there will be more schools that want to look at a mobile unit of this kind and they can put the funding towards that. Yeah, and I just want to clarify oh, for you, Ms. Mack, that um, the school determines the need, right? So the, the school that you have concerns about, they build their needs assessment and if they decide they need a mobile unit, then they could put their money towards it if that helps as well. Like no, it does help. I guess my concern is because I fully, fully support this and I know in certain communities every bit of this is needed. I would hate to think that this unit is not is sitting idle somewhere when it could be ha have a schedule where it could go to all of our community schools even if it's only once a month. I, I guess that's my issue. Yeah, yeah it do, unfortunately yeah. it doesn't work that way because the funding has to go with the school. Um, so we don't get to determine that, but as Michelle explained, those other schools, when they get their funding, they may want to build the same thing in it and share it between a few schools. Okay, well, thank you for that clarification. Ms. Causey, did you have a question? Yes, good afternoon and thank you for that presentation. I agree that this seems like a uh, really wonderful uh, resource for students and families um, in need in this particular area. I did have some questions uh, in terms of need. One of the things that we heard when uh, schools went virtual uh, was the need for technical support for parents, um, especially if there was not in-home broadband available in that area and they needed to try and figure out how to use a mobile hotspot. Um, so is that something that's been considered or could be considered? I just want to make sure that I understand the question um, um, that the mobile hotspots could be distributed to families using the mobile unit. Is that the question that? that will... Well, that that's a good idea also, um, but really is there going to be um, opportunities for technical support staff and we have um, 
our own BCPS staff, but I know at times they also use um, students that are in um, technology programs um, to be helpful, that they would staff that mobile unit, you know, every other Friday for two hours or however you do it, where it would be a convenient time frame, as some other board members have pointed out, convenient for the parents, you know, to get some support. That would have to be driven by the needs assessment. So if those three schools determined in their community needs assessment that that's one of the services, then yes. That, that could be offered. But again, we don't decide that. The community school decides that through their needs assessment. Absolutely. Okay, and I'm and I'm sorry if I missed it, but who staffs the mobile unit? If, for instance, um, the um, part of it that's designed for medical care. Mm -hmm. So is that with Baltimore County Department of Health providing dentists and um, medical care, I know we have nurses and God bless them all because they've been working so hard through all of this. Um, but that's just my question is, how is the staffing arranged? Yes, so um, it's arranged through community partners. And because we're in the very early stages, which is just building the unit, we have not solidified who the partner will, who the healthcare partner will be to manage the medical side of things. But that is the plan down the road that we work with our community partners to be the ones that staff. And so okay. you may be seeing another contract coming through once we obtain who those partners are because we're going to be spending money on that partnership. Okay, great. And um, if you could just review the funding again, um, how, how much is it going to cost and how much, <clears throat> what percentage of the funding for those schools does this represent? Um, the approximate cost for this unit particularly is around $600,000, and that's just to construct the unit itself. Um, that divided amongst the three schools is dependent on how we look at grant funding because the funding kind of moves from year to year. So um, it, it, it's probably a third of their budget. But again, they still have some funds left over from the personnel grant that they're putting towards this. So it's a mixture of fiscal years and a mixture of funding across multiple years. Um, what I have, what I will say though, is that schools were very thoughtful in talking to their stakeholders about whether or not they felt like this was a good use of funds. And hands down, um, everyone found that this is probably um, life changing for many of, of the schools and, and accessing families where they are versus um, the task of trying to get families to them. And thank you for that final piece. And how were the um, parents um, and stakeholders involved in providing input? Wonderful question. So um, each school has to have, is a, it's required for every school that is a community school to have a stakeholder shared decision-making team. That is an equal balance of school staff, family members, and community members, as well as student input. And so our community school facilitators are charged with convening that team, sometimes all together, sometimes in, um, in pieces simply because of scheduling, um, but to, to gather the collective voice of all of those stakeholders and really um, put that together and share back out what the findings were from every group. Thank you very much. And I had a wonderful opportunity to visit Sandalwood Elementary School um, and Mr. Thomas was there and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to visit again and see this. So thank you. Ms. Stansberry, before I call for the um, a motion, can I just clarify? Um, I don't know where I heard this, but I heard that we were going to use or an, a, a bus that is no longer able to be used to transport students. Is that a true statement? You know, that's not us. That might be something else. We are actually um, contracting with a company to build the bus from the wheels up. Okay, I just thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, I can just real quick, Miss Mack. That's a discussion we had had around the ESAW mobile unit. Uh, okay, well, so I, it's all running together, so I just wanted that's to clarify. Okay. Um, if there are no further questions, and in, in the interest of time, may I have a motion to approve the community schools mobile unit, mobile so units? So moved, Offerman. And is that a second, Mr. Thomas? Second, yes. 
Ms. Cox, may I have a roll call, roll call vote, please? Sure. Um, Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pastor? She already gone. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Okay, our next item is Advanced Placement Summer Institute at Goucher College. For that, I'll give it back to Dr. McComas. Yes, ma'am, and we will, um, in short order, turn it right over to Dr. Wistead um, to share with us. Um, yes, I have um, Dr. Wildridge with me. Um, this, uh, you may have heard us talk about the Advanced Placement Summer Institute in the past. It's something that BCPS has engaged in in the past, but we were given an opportunity through MSDE to have grant funds um, for our advanced placement um, initiatives. And so we are bringing forward some information to explain to you what the plan is for our Advanced Placement Summer Institute to use those grant funds from MSDE. So Dr. Wildridge, our next slide. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Baltimore County Public Schools College and Career Readiness Programs align with our strategic plan, the COMPASS, our Pathway to Excellence in the Learning, Accountability and Results section. Our goal is simple, preparing each child to graduate ready to enter their chosen career, career training, military training, or credit-bearing college coursework. Our work is to provide the necessary supports that will deliver on this promise. Next slide, please. BCPS partners with the College Board to provide advanced placement courses to thousands of BCPS students each year. Advanced placement courses offer students college level potentially credit bearing experiences while still in high school. These courses are taught by our very own BCPS teachers. Research conducted in 2011 by Cheswski, Mattern, and Shaw indicates that students enrolled in AP courses are more likely to attend and graduate college in four years than students who do not enroll in an AP course. This likelihood increases if a student enrolls in an AP course and sits for the AP end of course exam. And of course, students who enroll in an AP course, sit for the end of course exam and score a three or four or five are, are the most likely to graduate college in four years. Students who take AP courses taught by teachers who have been trained by College Board via the Annual Advanced Placement Summer Institute are more likely to sit for the end of course exam and score a three or higher. Next slide, please. The AP Summer Institute offers the most thorough professional learning available to AP educators. Attendees engage in over 30 hours of content rich training designed to strengthen how they teach their specific advanced placement course. Participants leave the Advanced Placement Summer Institute experience with ready to use strategies and pedagogical tools shared by experienced educators within the AP community. At the Summer Institute, participants will explore each section of the course and exam description, including the unit guides, while making connections to the course's cur uh, curricular requirements. They will also begin to develop a course plan by unit and topic that incorporates the full scope of the AP course uh, for the school's academic calendar. They examine formative and summative assessment items to identify content and skill pairings that are the targets of these assessments and create lesson plans to reinforce content and skill connections. They get the opportunity to practice applying the scoring guidelines from the most recent AP exams uh, and using student examples of student work. They identify student strengths and weaknesses using data available through the AP classroom and instructional planning reports. And they explore ready to use strategies, instructional materials and pedagogical tools pertinent to the content and skills required for success in the AP course. Most importantly, I believe they develop meaningful connections with others in their AP uh, community, which serve as a lifelong support for them. Participants explore these AP resources in depth, unit guides, topic questions, personal progress checks, the AP question bank, instructional planning reports, syllabus development guides, sample syllabi, and the AP community, all designed to ensure student success on their end of course AP exams. 
Next slide, please. In short, BCPS won an MSDE AP program support grant. We want funds from MSDE in order to fiscally sponsor the partici participation of our high school teachers at the Advanced Placement Summer Institute this summer, um, June and July 2022 at our local college, Goucher College. Final slide, please. Thank you and any questions? Um, I'm going to ask a question first. Um, since obviously the summer is outside the normal work tour for many teachers, how will teachers be compensated? That's the first question and combined with that is given the year that teachers have had, the two years I should say the teachers have had, how do we even know that teachers will want to sign up for this? Um, because I'm not even a teacher and I'm looking forward to the summer of doing nothing. So how do we even know? Wonderful questions. Thank you for asking. The grant is actually for uh, $240,000. So we're asking you today for on um, to approve the $115,000 that will go toward registration. The remaining funds will be applied to the stipends for teachers to be paid to participate as well as some curricular uh, supports. And in the past, when we've had an opportunity to present um, or we presented opportunities like this to teachers, how how many teachers have taken advantage of it? And I and again, I think it'll be different because I'm sure people are just counting down to the third week of June. I, th I think it's a great question. We um, the number of teachers that we have been able to send each year has varied wildly depending on the year. So for example, in summer of 2021, we were not allowed to send teachers to co uh, to conferences. The only, only six were allowed to attend because there are two courses out of the 36 that are AP courses that are required uh, that their teachers are required to attend the Summer Institute. So those six teachers had to go in order to be able to teach the course this year. Um, the summer before that, we were still we were in COVID, so we had only sent 15 teachers and those, they attended uh, virtually. The summer before, we were able to send 75 teachers. That was the last time we were fully uh, pre-COVID, fully um, you know, face to face at Goucher. So it, the, the number of teachers that we have been able to send, um, as I said, has has varied widely. I do think that with our focus on equity and advanced placement programs, we have a great chance of filling all of the seats. Principals constantly um, clamor for the opportunity and su uh, request support to be able to send as many staff members as possible. And to go back to your second question um, initially, um, we put together a uh, focus group including central office staff, administrators, teachers, AP coordinators, uh, to talk about how can we best allocate these seats? Um, how can we get our best bang for our buck? How can we target those te AP teachers that um, we think would benefit the most from this training this summer? Thank you. If I may, I just want to add um, a, a, a point here as well. Um, while I would agree with you, our teachers have had uh, quite an exhausting last 24 months. Uh, this is the type of professional learning that often um, rejuvenates teachers um, because they are not, they get to be the learners um, as opposed to being the instructor. Um, and so often, and the College Board uh, professional learning opportunities are truly robust. Um, and, and so it, this is actually one of those uh, opportunities, while yes, it's teacher time and yes, um, it is work for them. It's a different type of work that often um, is actually very rejuvenating for professionals in that way. Thank you. Um, board members, any questions in the interest of time? If we could limit them, that would be helpful because I believe we have two more contracts. Is that correct, Dr. McComas? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I just, or Christian Thomas. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so I just had one quick question. Um, it said this this is from June to July 2022. Obviously, the school year ends sometime in June. So I'm just wondering, like, is it are they on weekdays or then weekends? How is how is the institute like? How does the weekly schedule work for teachers? Mm, thank you for asking. Each uh, 
each course is actually four days. And so the first week is the last week in June, and then there's a week off. Uh, the Goucher College doesn't hold the Institute over the 4th of July. So actually, I think there's two weeks this year where it's not being held. And then there's the week, uh, two weeks in, in July. Each teacher only attends four days. So one week, one four day week. Um, each course is one four day week. Thank you. Mr. Offerman. Yes, uh, as a person who was the uh, AP coordinator at Towson High School for a total of 15 years, uh, having this opportunity for teachers in the area is just wonderful. Uh, to get this kind of training, many times before we had to send people far away or they had to go on their own far away, number one. And also number two, a lot of times what was offered was a one day or a one and a half day kind of, kind of a uh, seminar. Uh, I, I am interested in asking, uh, I'm assuming that the that the courses involved are, are being presented by the uh, by uh, by AP uh, in in uh, in uh, in terms of which ones are being selected and offered. Is that correct? Um, could you clarify that question for me? Yeah, okay. in, other, in other words, who determines which which courses will be uh, will be offered. So uh, College Board partners with Goucher College to determine which of their 36 courses are offered during which weeks. Some of the courses are offered two out of the three weeks uh, if they're very popular or um, highly attended courses. Um, some are only offered one week out of the three, but all 36 are available this summer. I, I would believe this is money very, very well spent. If, if if the uh, if the uh, if the committee uh, agrees. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Uh, Ms. Causey. Thank you very much. This is an exciting opportunity. Um, I had asked in the chat if the statistics that you cited, which are very exciting statistics, could be made available and attached to board docs. Um, and also, uh, so how many teachers um, or seats are available? Um, for this program and it's a grant. So what is the total value of the grant? Thank you for asking. The total value of the grant is 240,000. $115,000 will be used for registration for 125 teachers. Woo! <laughs> That's excellent. And then um, could you compare um, this with another program that the College Board has where I had received a lot of input from teachers, uh, I want to say before the pandemic, um, where teachers are invited to be graders of the advanced placement tests. Um, and there was some issue with a stipend being made available that I believe got clarified, but I'm just wondering um, how that works because that's another opportunity for our teachers to um, expand their knowledge and then bring that back to the school system. Sure, great question. So the Summer Institute is a holistic uh, approach to learning as many best practices and um, gathering as many best resources as possible for teachers of the course who are going to go in August 31st and they're going to set their syllabus and they're going to teach children all year long in preparation for the, the May AP exam. The reading, becoming an AP reader, is when College Board um, curates, for lack of a better term, uh, the best AP teachers in the county, and they determine that based on um, several factors, including the teacher's record in terms of number of students taking their end of your courses um, and their scores and then uh, an application process. And those veteran master AP uh, teachers are then hired by the College Board to go to central locations and sit and grade all of those end of course AP exams and they are those who end up scoring our kids exams and that is um, it's a job right but it's also a professional learning experience because those master teachers understand every intricacy of the the question for their content and they can come back and share with their colleagues who teach that exam exactly what College Board is looking for from our students when they sit for the end of course exam. And Ms. Causey, to address like 
you know, what happened a few years ago, I, I, I'm not sure if we've discussed this in the past or not, but an anonymous tip was sent to our ethics board because teachers were being paid by BCPS and being paid by the college board at the same time, which is why we had to restrict um, who was going and when they were going. So, and, and the type of leave they were taking. So that I think has something to do with what your question related to as well. Right, and that's uh, to your point, Ms. Causey, that's what you, we did work through the resolution on that uh, to make sure that everyone was um, appropriate. Yes, thank you for that. And um, again, it's a it's an exciting opportunity and we do have highly qualified teachers, as, as you said, master teachers that are engaged in in these opportunities. So thank you for all of that. Thank you, Ms. Causey. May I have a motion to approve the advanced placement summer institute at Goucher College? So moved, Thomas. Offerman. Second, Thomas. Thank you. And Ms. Cox, may I have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Um, Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Okay, our next item is the DBQ project. And we can just have Ms. Shea and Mr. Billingsley jump right on into that in light of time. Okay, thank you. Oh, Go <laughs> thank ahead, you Megan. so much. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, we're going to be, I know we're short on time, so we're going to jump right in. I'm just going to quickly intro to say we have been to the curriculum committee actually a few times mm -hmm. on DBQ. Um, the first time we came, it was actually a print version, and then we actually came with an update um, about a year and a half ago describing how this related to our disciplinary literacy project. Um, last year in the pandemic, we had an opportunity to expand into a whole new horizon about digital access for the DBQ um, with some rave results from our teachers and students. And so Mr. Billingsley and I are here as a preview of a contract that will be coming forward um, for DBQ expansion to include elementary school as well as to shift the format. So um, we're going to turn it over to Mr. Billingsley so he can talk a little bit about why we use DBQ, the feedback we've gotten from teachers and students and some of our usage, and then talk a little bit about what's next. So Mr. Billingsley. Thank you, Megan. Um, and for those who don't know me again, I'm John Billingsley, the Director of Social Studies. And if we could advance the slide, you've I know we're sensitive in time, so we'll kind of move through it. Um, so we talked a little about what it is. Again, we brought it here four years ago, and I'm bringing it back today because um, students, teachers have been so enthusiastic, and I would say even demanding that we make sure we bring back and advocate for the, the online version. And Christian, I see you smiling because I'm sure you've done a few DBQs in your, your career. Okay, so we can move forward and talk about what the DBQ is. As some of you might remember, the DBQ is a literacy program designed to help students um, now elementary through secondary to learn, read, interpret sources, and use those sources to create evidence-based arguments. It supports, as we brought to the, um, the committee last year, it supports disciplinary literacy through um, the use of sourcing, contextualization, causation, cooperation, multiple perspectives in the development of both oral and um, written arguments. Next slide. So the typical DBQ includes anywhere from five to 15 documents um, that students use to analyze maps, charts, images, quotes, primary um, the his, um, historical documents, diary entries, and excerpts from books. Students then use those documents as historical evidence to justify response in an argument. It's as close as a student can come to being a historian without actually being it. So when we talk about the apprentice model, this is it's really, really embodied in, in the DBQ and the DBQ process. Next slide. So the question is, you know, why are we doing this? The DBQ online provides all students with the opportunity to engage with authentic sources and to build evidence-based arguments and explanations. I'll give you a quick snippet if you want to look at it, but we can move on to the next slide. Okay, yeah. So the DBQs are authentic assessments that require students to evaluate primary and secondary sources. They analyze and evaluate their importance, take positions, depend on point of view. And this type of source analysis and evidence-based writing are key skills that can be allied to a variety of content areas, um, to other assessments. So you think about MCAP, think about SAT, ACT, AP exams, um, as well as career paths, and probably most important, for real life, this is what we do in real life is have some analysis of um, key resources. Next slide. 
So the DBQ online, because that's really what we're pitching today, provides a wide variety, ugh, a wide variety of tools that allow us to differentiate, uh, differentiate for scaffolding and support for students. It includes audio read alouds, an extended version with supporting questions. It has English and Sp Spanish toggle, so students can toggle back and forth for L learners. Um, and hopefully that will be even further expanded in the future. It has guided essays, it has essay builders. And finally, teachers can um, customize the assignment to a specific class or to a specific group of students or even to individual students. Um, so that it really has that drill down ability in terms of scaffolding and support. Slide eight or the next slide. Good. The DBQ also allows um, teachers to provide customized direction and supports as students engage in the resources. So if you look at like the left hand side, I believe on your screen, the teacher directions, they can actually embed them in the resource itself. And if you look all the way to the right, you can see that students then can respond within the document itself. So it makes for a very interactive um, and more interactive engaging um, resource than simply the print version. And that's something teachers have really been like that's you know array of reviews about the dbq online allows teachers to provide customized feedback to students directly through a pre-selected and customized comments within the assignment it also integrates with schoology a feature that teachers love because it makes their grading lives a lot easier and and you'll see there because you can remember right you have your comments at the end of a piece of paper at the long and you're like where exactly was that in the document here teachers can put it at that point like so they can cite within the resource itself exactly where kids did a great job on their um, essay or whether they needed additional support Next slide. Um, the DBQ provides students with a variety of tools to annotate um, sources, something we've really worked with in supporting disciplinary literacy across content areas. Students can take digital notes, um, teachers can review and offer feedback on those notes. So as we talk about meaningful note taking, and this is that piece where teachers can really get in there and help kids hone in their skills um, within the document itself. Next slide, which brings us to the how. The DBQ project and the DBQ online are currently being used in our secondary schools and in pilot schools uh, or 13 of our pilot schools. There were 14, but one school had to drop out. The implementation of the product has been and will continue to support, be supported in a variety of ways. We've done uh, PD, we have a DBQ leadership cohort, which has been a tremendous asset to us to continue to provide support um, within the system and its school-based professional development. We also have an asynchronous 24-7 learning modules that are available to teachers, and they have really, really embraced it even during our COVID years. Um, teachers have still leaned in on this professional development, and I would say it's probably the highest level of professional development of any that, that we have, have offered in social studies anyhow. As we're transitioning, I just also want to make a note. Um, teachers do still also have access to the print materials for DBQ that were purchased. Right. So this is not instead of, but rather um, a supplement, although so many of the accessibility features, um, of course, are unique to the online. Um, so when we talk about blended learning, oftentimes we talk about using a blend of print and digital resources, which we know is an important literacy skill as well. Um, so I just wanted to add that piece, but some of those accessibility features and the feedback features and annotation, that's what teachers have really given us a lot of feedback and certainly last year of course <laughs> and you're going to see some statistics in a moment uh, it was perfect timing that dbq had expanded those online offerings yes. just as we were making that shift so and just make, wanted make, to note that. yeah making that's a good point because the other thing is is dbq updates their materials like they have launched 13 new units on social justice that we were able to take those and those automatically are kind of integrated in and um and teachers have already embraced those so the flexibility that that's involved there is tremendous on the online um version Next slide. Going through our DQ. So in terms of professional development, um, we do a variety of things, but the biggest thing is we do a two day training with all teachers, one full day kind of the onboarding, and then we do a second day follow up to kind of help teachers learn to norm and, and look at um, providing quality feedback as kids write um, their essays. Uh, we've trained, I would, well, at this point, I would say 75% of existing teachers have been trained, um, probably a little more than that. We have a commitment to every new teacher that comes to BCPS and social studies will receive the two-day training by the DBQ project. Any 
teachers who come in with more experience or we've missed, we slowly pick them up um, through our DBQ leadership cohort trainings. But we do um, an introductory session in August. We provide continued PD throughout the year, mini PDs with our uh, DBQ leadership cohort. We do a small bite um, P DBQ trainings throughout the year for teachers who want to drop in like a lunch hour in the morning or the afternoons. Um, and we also have the 24-7 asynchronous course, which is very, very robust um, that are available to teachers. So let's talk about the next slide, which is my favorite thing to talk about. The most excited thing to talk about is the use of traits, right? <laughs> because it's the, probably the thing that most justifies um, why should we expand this resource and our teachers and students using the product. So next slide. Now, our ability to track this really became involved with, remember, the digital version because the digital online version allowed us to track the numbers. When it was hard copy, it was a little harder to track whether teachers are, are, were using that just through simple surveys. But when it, but during the pandemic, when the DBQ then gave us access to the digital to help us carry through um, our virtual year, we were to begin tracking those numbers. So during the 21-22 school year, our virtual year, approximately 21,000 students access the DBQ materials. Remember that's grades six through 12. Um, so the question is, what does that mean in comparison to the nation, school systems that have already have online versions? Because remember, it was just given to us. We had to provide professional development and roll it out there. Other school systems throughout the country have already been using the online version. So we hit the next slide. We will find out that during the 2021 school year, we were actually the super user. We led the nation above Georgia, Florida, Texas, <laughs> California in the use, and not just a little bit, but a whole lot. And that's based on the fact that we had never used the online version till the start of the 2021 school year, but our teachers so embraced it that we just kind of skyrocketed. and. Um, at our monthly check-ins, DBQ kept coming back and said, it's amazing what you, you all are doing. You're surpassing systems that have had it much longer and it did digital since the start. Um, so BCPS, not even the state, just BCPS leads in the entire nation, uh, which is pretty crazy. So how are we falling out this year in the 21-22 school year? Well, next slide. We remain in first place. Um, we've actually had a 30% increase over last year and 30% uh, more than any other uh, uh, state in, in the system that's using the DBQ. Now, these numbers are a little bit lower, but you got to remember, we're only halfway through, this, not even halfway through the school year yet, or just at the halfway point. Um, so we expect those numbers to continue to climb up even higher throughout the year, which would certainly put us in the position to be the highest using user of DBQ um, in the nation. And I go back to again, we're just one, you know, county within a state, and and we're comparing ourselves to complete and entire states overall. Um, so are we are we using it? I would say absolutely. If we look what teachers um, are saying, if we go to the next slide, you can see some of their comments. I won't read them to you, but see, I kind of highlighted the key parts, like. High quality academic resources. Uh, the digital platform allows us to customize lesson building with simple clicks. Um, provide immediate feedback to students. We're engaged and appreciate the chunking of the paragraph writing. Um, read the text to students. Common assessment for all students in the entire grade level. And you can see on the upper right of your screen, like the satisfaction level with statements of the DBQ, that the teachers were, you know, overall very much in support of it. No negative comments when surveyed. The next slide is what students are saying. Uh, makes it easier to annotate. It's more fun. You could take notes on the one document instead of it had click all over the place. Available read aloud tab. It helps I love our environmentally conscious high school student who yeah. said we saved trees by shifting. Well, and we think about that, but that is a huge savings because if you're talking about printing out these documents, these documents, the, a packet of them is very, very, yes, Christian's like, it could be like this thick. Um, and also we reduce all of that and make it digitally, you know, so it's not like call savings, but it's also an environmental, a, a very positive environmental um, action that we can take. Um, so I think that's great. So students are saying yes, teachers are saying yes, and today I guess we hope that you say yes as well. I think that ends ends the um, our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Billingsley, and uh, take a deep breath. You did that very, very quickly. I was trying to be time. sensitive with the time. I appreciate this, this speed talking. Ms. Causey, you had a question? <laughs> yes, thank you for that presentation, and I've um, heard just great accolades for the DBQ process. Um, 
utilize. And I, my question relates to the um, licensing structure. Is it a per school system, per grade, and per student? Hopefully, it's not per use. Um, no. Given the statistics <laughs> that we have, hey, right, uh, that would be more expensive. It's actually per school, per, school. Um, per level. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then there are other digital resources that in the past um, the system has used with similar access to historical documents and things like that. So with the use of this program, are there any other programs that we can use less and save money in that regard? Um, and is this, uh, uh, I mean, if you have what the cost is, that would be helpful. So we were, um, because I was had the benefit of listening mm -hmm. to the previous presentations, I was texting Mr. Billingsley and saying, do we at least have a mm -hmm. ballpark? I will say I, we're still working with purchasing on the total cost because, of course, professional development is also built in. I was trying to at least give you a ballpark of a per student. Um, so, Mr. Billingsley, I don't know if you're ready to comment on sure. that piece. I, I was trying to do the math real quick in my head again because it was breaking down. Um, I can give you kind of the cost per school if that would be helpful. I don't know if that's the kind of the appropriate place to start, but we know per year for an elementary school, it's about $3,700. For a uh, middle school, it's fifty six, dollars and for a high school, it's about thirteen. dollars And the reason that cost differs is because the amount of resources okay. that are available per per each one. Now in elementary school, and that's a particular, it's just not social studies. It's ELA, uh, social, social studies, ELA and science and even health education. The DBQ is expanded so that other, it can be used in a variety of different um, content areas at the elementary school level. Which, which I, if I can, yeah. I think goes back to Ms. Causey's other question. I think it's a great question no. looking forward. I would not today be able to say it has replaced anything else, but what I can say is the pilot in elementary school is a social studies ELA um, collaboration. So for example, it would replace the cost of an ELA novel for that unit or a particular trade book because we would use this one resource for both social studies and ELA. So I definitely think it has the potential. There is some overlap um, with things like discovery, for example, another digital resource. The difference here is what um, is intentional about the DBQ is it's multiple sources around the same topic. So you're exploring, which is not the case in some of those other resources where they have in the DBQ around this inquiry arc curated multiple primary and secondary resources that are all centered around the same content. So I think it's a really important question for us to consider moving forward where we can really take a deep dive to see what it could replace. Um, I wouldn't be able to say that just yet, but like I said, the pilot in elementary school it does right now in the pilot schools replace uh, novels that are a different trade book for those units in those grade levels because they're using this source instead for both social studies and ELA concurrently. And, it, I, I, that, and I do yeah. appreciate that it's also available in print because we know some students correct that. Absolutely. So. And, and it carries also with this one the unique thing is because this is one of the first resources that we carry from fourth grade all the way through middle school into high school. So think about, it, it, in terms of trajectory and skill development for students, um, this one's resource is really going to carry them through. And in, at the secondary level, we certainly have some other print resources that teachers begin to lean in on, but I, I think they've definitely enthralled with them, the DBQ, and that's becoming the kind of the default resource. But that was a very but, good question. And we have seen in the same classroom where some students are all in on the digital and then in some mm -hmm. instances the teacher has um, print for even those students because you know that gives them that flexibility as well. And oftentimes they'll scaffold them, they'll start with the print mm -hmm. and then move them over to the digital because it as because it just helps with the initial hands on. In the interest of time, since there's nothing in the chat about other board members having a question, may I have a motion to approve the contract for the DBQ project? So move, Thomas. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Second Offerman. Ms. Cox, can you take a roll call vote, please? Sure, Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And then our final agenda item is one that I have a personal interest in. Um, <laughs> CTE lumber and plywood materials. Yes. So thank you very much. So I'm here. We um, There will be a contract coming forward. It is a joint um, effort with the Office of Facilities and Support Services. But of course, you know, we have many programs in uh, career and technical education that would also utilize this contract. 
Um, the contract's going to provide for the ongoing purchase of lumber and plywood materials that we use in many of our CTE um, courses and programs. It also allows us to use both standard products, but also expands to some of the higher end materials. Um, and the part that our team is particularly excited about is this new contract is going to add multiple vendors. Um, this is really important that we're able to use a contract negotiated price with multiple vendors because I'm sure many of you know supply chain challenges have impacted did everyone in particular um, classrooms. So this is um, a big part of why we wanted to, to move forward with this. Um, next slide. So because we're the curriculum committee and I wanted to illustrate a little bit of how we use some of these materials instructionally. And so we use the lumber for some of our, we use two by fours and two by six for some of our framing projects, um, but we also use plywood for a number of projects. So we use the CDX or marine grade. These are for any of our projects that are gonna be used in outdoors. So some of our um, programs do things like Adirondack chairs or benches or sheds. Um, we also use the Luan for some of our smaller projects or modeling. Um, and then the oriented strand board or OSB is used um, as part of our um, modeling for some of our um, construction projects as well. Um, and then we use some of the plywood and OSB for what you can see there is some of our um, integration projects that we use with our hashtag CTE made initiative. So there you can see where um, a team of our students worked with a local vendor flowers and fancies to design flower boxes. Some of you may recall attending the state of the schools and seeing some of our centerpieces, some of our light boxes, some of the different design projects. Um, and then we also use some of it for our pre built with our tiny homes in some of our construction programs. Um, so listed there, we use this in many of our different pro um, programs, of course, in carpentry, but also in our building and construction technology, as well as in our advanced tech ed and our PLTW um, engineering programs. Um, so we have a lot of use. And, and part of what's also really important is some of the skills that our students need to learn in these programs is how to decide on the appropriate material. So rather than just having one material um, students actually use when is it appropriate to use plywood versus OSB or when would you need marine grade because of what you ex actually need the product to be able to withstand. Um, that's an important skill set that the students in these programs have to learn to develop. So we're excited to have a contract that allows us and our teachers the flexibility um, for making those purchases. Um, so that is I think that's it in the next slide. I think it just says uh, Thank you. <laughs> um, so I tried to go as fast as Mr. Billingsley. So the irony of this conversation is my husband is a contractor and my daughter approached him about putting an addition on his home. And just last night he said that is not something that we would undertake now since plywood just went back up to $60 a sheet. Yeah. So my question is, do we, well, do we look at the conditions and the supply chain and the cost before we place orders, because obviously with some flexibility, fly, you know, two months ago, plywood was $30 a sheet. Do we have that and who orders and how, how do we look at issues like that? Yeah, so this is a perfect example of where the buildings and contracts and purchasing team does all of that negotiation, which is beyond my scope. But what I can share with you is the benefit of having a multi-year contract is that then we can rely on that contract price and not be impacted oh. by those fluctuations. So that's a part of what's negotiated, um, which is really important, as well as having multiple vendors. So when in the current contract, we're very limited in the one that CTE uses. Um, I'm not going to name the vendor because I don't want to get in trouble, um, but you can certainly look that up. But then when that happens, we are stuck. We don't have the ability. So part of why we are interested in partnering with facilities and being a part of this contract is to give us that flexibility. In terms of some of the more nuanced questions you have about how we negotiate that and how do we respond to companies and vendors, I wouldn't really be the best person. I understand that. Thank yeah. you. Um, board sure. members, any other questions? If not, may I have a motion to approve con uh, KSH 18 lumber and plywood? So move, Thomas. Second. Is there a second? Uh, second, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Um, Ms. Cox, may I have a roll call vote, please? Um, Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I adjourn the meeting, I did want to thank everybody, um, staff and um, committee members for being so flexible with your time. 
Um, if there is no further business, um, the meeting is adjourned and we will look for the responses um, that staff provided in the weekly update that staff will provide in the weekly update. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care.